having me. Um, let's get started. So, as you mentioned, I'm Tom Reynolds. Uh, this is me on GitHub and also my blog, which has a bunch of uh, additional content kind of on 3D and middleman and preprocessor topics. Uh, I'm the creator of Middleman, which is a static uh, blogging, prototyping, and uh, front-end development framework. It basically gives you something like the power of Rails and allows you to use it in a static context or if you're a purely uh, web context or a thick client. I work at Instrument, which is a digital creative agency in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we work on a whole host of different things from film to interactives to web and also uh, physical. One of the things we uh, just released recently for Google at I.O. was the Google Map Dive. The Map Dive is seven large instances of Chrome, each running on a different screen, uh, which is, allows you to dive 3D through this world. And it's built in both WebGL and also CSS 3D. And something we worked on a little bit uh, longer ago, last November, was Google Zeitgeist for this year, which is a, a site that lets you explore the search trends for Google over the past year. And we also embraced CSS 3D in here to kind of bring a little extra spark. So let's talk about some 3D. We're not going to talk about WebGL. WebGL is this massive topic. You write all your code in C, or it compiles down to C. It runs on the graphics card. You can make video games. You can do pretty much anything you want in WebGL. But this is a CSS conference, so we're just going to completely ignore that. So what does CD, 3D CSS actually mean? It's written in CSS. That's the most obvious part. And it works with CSS. So what that means is, like anything else in CSS, uh, by just adding some 3D components, you're not going to trample over the rest of it, and it's going to cascade. So if you have a style, like you have an anchor tag that works, looks a certain way, when you move it into 3D, it's not going to stop working that way. It's going to work exactly the same. Interactions still work. You can still attach hover uh, pseudo selectors to things that are in 3D. The system will figure it out. Your mouse will go where it's supposed to go, and everything will react as expected. And any other content in there is also interactive. So you can tab through your forms. You can have animations going that are controlled by some entirely different system, like JavaScript. And CSS is simply just moving these things around for you. One of the reasons I think this is really interesting is for mobile transitions. So when we talk about 3D, it's really easy to overdo everything. And just a little bit of movement, and you throw it on a website that's the size of like a 27-inch monitor, then it's, it's overbearing, and it's too much, and it's everywhere. But in mobile, we're constrained. And uh, we're used to these side to side, up and down, forward and backwards page transitions a lot. So I think 3D fits in here really well. Users expect a little bit of flair. Uh, Apple maybe does a little too much flair. But at least everyone's accustomed to seeing some of these kind of movements in a mobile context. And the lack of transitions is one of the things that screams to me that it is not a native app, or it does not behave the way users expect it to behave. So it doesn't necessarily mean 3D, but things should move and animate smoothly. And that's something we can do. It's not out of the, the realm of possibility for um, uh, mobile web apps. So there's the plan. I'm going to discuss 3D coordinate systems and how things move in 3D and what that means in CSS. Every system's a little different. Uh, the, the definition of which direction is up is not well-defined across multiple systems. CSS has its opinion on this, but it may not be the same as 3JS or uh, any other kind of 3D modeling system. I'm going to talk about the transform style and how you, this which is the only way you can access uh, 3D transforms from CSS. I'm going to go over a couple uh, really popular mobile transitions and how to re-implement them in CSS. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the far future or near future possibilities for this stuff, uh, looping back around to running code directly on the GPU. So this is your basic three-dimensional axis system. Uh, Z is coming out towards you from the screen. X and Y are about how you'd expect it if you've ever done anything with positioning in CSS or Canvas. Except for everything is oriented around the center of this object, as opposed to the top left, which is common uh, in normal CSS and also in Canvas. To move things around in 3D, you use the translation. So the commands that you can pass in to transform, which is 
the style element that allows us to do 3D transforms. It's not prefixed here. Uh, it's not prefixed everywhere. So I'm just going to leave it as its root version here, which I believe runs in the most recent versions of Chrome and Firefox. But the WebKit prefix would still be necessary for mobile. So what you pass into the transform style is a series of commands. And unlike a lot of uh, CSS, they don't overwrite each other if you do one too many. And they don't need commas to separate them. Rather, it's a, set, it's a series of steps that you're telling the object to make. So the first step is you say, I translate along x 100%. These translations are relative to the object being moved. So it's not saying 100% of the screen. It's saying 100% of the thing that's moving. And then you move it down by 10 pixels. So if both these are normal. You have to remember which direction Z is. Z, as it increases, comes towards you as the, as the viewer. And negative puts you back deeper into the scene. And the common units that we pass to this are both percentages and pixels. Second most important thing you can do, in addition to moving in 3D, is also rotating in 3D. Here again, we have commands rotate X, rotate Y, and rotate Z. These can be stacked on top of each other in, in order. Uh, these rotate around the axis, which means it, it's not entirely intuitive what that means. So I'll have a demo in just a second, and I'll show you what that means. Uh, there, there are degrees. You can go negative, you can go positive. Zero is, is facing directly as you would expect forward. You can also use radians, but unless you have a preprocessor or something, uh, or a CSS uh, math library, then it's going to be kind of a pain to work with radians. And finally, there's the perspective. The perspective sets the distance of the viewer from the scene. Without this, uh, the browser won't even kick in the GPU. You won't get any 3D animations at all. So you have to put this on a parent somewhere above the elements you're animating. This number, it basically, it, it's saying how far you are from the object. And so if you're closer to it, things are be more exaggerated. If you're far away, uh, big movements are going to look smaller. There's some magic numbers. Somewhere between 400 and 2,000 usually look just about right. So I know that was all very abstract. So here's some actual code and some interactive elements. So we have a square. And we're going to apply these transforms that are on, on top to it. So if we move x, we move left to right like you would expect. y is up and down. And the magic is in z. As we increase it, it comes closer to you or recedes into the background. The rotation is along uh, those three-dimensional axes. So x, which runs from left to right, means that it'll flip over the top. y runs from top to bottom. It'll flip from side to side. z runs towards you, and you get just a normal kind of rotation. So you can see that as we start to rotate something, uh, the thing that tricks our brain into thinking that it's actually a 3D object is, is the angle. Perspective right now is, is pretty huge. We can, we can increase it and get further away from the object, and you'll see that that angle uh, decreases a little bit. If we get really close up into it, it becomes kind of absurd. Uh, as I mentioned before, transform applies these commands in order. So if you translate something, then rotate it, it's different from rotate so rotating something and then translating it. So for example, if we take this and rotate it off to the side, and then we move it out along Z, it doesn't move towards the camera per se. I'm oh, sorry, it does in this case. It moves towards the camera, exactly like I said it would. Uh, but if we reverse the order of command so that we rotate it first and then translate it, basically are picking your angle. Z, according to the object, is still straight out in front of it, even though it's off to the side for us. So now when we move Z, it moves along its own axis. So can you actually use this thing? Uh, it, it's great. It's in all modern browsers. Uh, it's on mobile. I haven't included Opera here, but I assume it'll basically look exactly like Chrome as soon as they're done with that. Uh, currently, Opera doesn't support it, but it's a niche thing. Uh, don't kill me if you work for Opera. Uh, it also works on mobile Safari and Chrome for Android and iOS. 
for Android, that means uh, 3.0 and newer. There is the asterisk, though. IE 10 has not supported a property called preserve 3D. And I'm going to show why this is so important that it basically means that IE 10 can't really even use any of this stuff. So preserve 3D is one of only two options for the transform style style. Uh, the system basically says, if an item is nested beneath me in the DOM, how do I render it? And the default is flat, which means ignore it. If something's transformed, everything else get below it gets the same transform. So the cascading transform overwrites everything below it. What you might expect would actually be the default is preserve 3D. Preserve 3D says if I rotate something and then I rotate its parent, the original transform is maintained and it just moves inside of it. So this isn't in 3D or in, in IE 10, which means it's, it, you can only do the most uh, the surface kind of animations in IE 10. So here's four elements, and they live in a parent element. And I rotate them all. Uh, I move them to the center, I rotate them, and then I just change their Z like I did before to push them out to the edges of this cube. Now if I start trying to rotate it, they collapse back down into a single cube, which doesn't make any sense at all. But if we turn on Preserve 3D, they'll maintain their internal uh, transform in addition to the parent transform that's rotating the entire object. All right. So I'm going to show off a couple uh, transitions, common transitions on mobile applications and show how to implement them. Uh, this is what I call receding layers. It basically says yeah, in mobile like UIs, we often have layers on top of each other and they're revealed beneath them. We could just slide this top off, off of it, but um, it's from behind, so it actually feels kind of nice to actually have it moving forward towards you as if coming from behind. I've been watching Rush Development all week in, on the plane instead of cramming. All right, so here's our animation. Tap on an object, and it moves off to the side, and something comes from behind it. So how do we implement that? So here's a two-up view of what's actually going on. We have two layers, and in the top right, there's an overhead view of the scene. So it'll, it'll help you know when something's behind something else. So you can see that they're beside each other right now. Uh, there's the magical perspective value off in the corner. The first one is translated 100% of its own self off to the right, so it basically takes it off screen. And the other one is not moving at all. So if we go ahead and run that animation again, all we're doing is translating the Z negative 250 pixels back into the scene. And you can see it moves back also in the overhead view. So our default state for this animation is when you come to this, it's placed behind it and shrunken down already. And then as it comes forward, we basically run a CSS transition from the negative 250 degree, or negative 250 pixel translation of Z back to zero where you expect it to be. Second super common animation, especially on iOS, is the card flip. So this demo has been out for CSS 3D forever and ever and ever. It's, it's pretty representative of a bunch of more complicated things you'll do. So I'll show you how to put one of these together. So here's Tobias, looking pert. And we can flip them around by interacting with this and double clicking. So again, we have two objects. We have a front and the back, and we bring off side to side from each other so we actually get an idea of what's going on. If we rotate this, it rotates in place, and rather than seeing some unknown backside of this object, we actually see the mirror image. So when we move it, put it back, and we flip it around backwards and put it behind itself, it ends up clipping over the top of the original image because they're both at the same translation of z equals zero. So the system doesn't know which one's actually in front of the other. What we can do is use a property called back phase visibility, which basically tells the object, if we can see the backside of it, we actually want to see through it. So that way, when this uh, back face, as you can see, is facing the other direction, it's invisible facing from the front direction. 
Now we can take the parent object of both of these objects and we can animate that uh, and it'll move the things inside of it because we have preserved 3D. So they both move together. This isn't two separate animations, you're just moving the parent and running a CSS transition. One thing you might notice is we're actually clipping at the top of this animation, which is pretty, pretty tacky. Alternatively, if we wanted to avoid clipping as we animate, we can just move our camera back or the object back, however you want to think about it, while the animation is running. So in this case, we have a little CSS animation that says, uh, very quickly, we're going to move this whole thing back 200 pixels and continue on rotating. And because of the order we've given it, uh, it doesn't affect how the rotation actually looks. So it goes back, rotates, comes forward. A uh, third example are carousels. So these are used rather sparingly, but you can see that the animation at the top is rotating on a cube. So as it folds in, it looks like it has four sides and gives it a nice little bit of depth. All right, so here's Job. <coughs> so we have two sides, Job's on each, and they rotate as if on a cube. So we want to inspect this scene. You can see what's actually going on. We've got a center point, which is 0, 0, 0. We've moved one, uh, the first frame closer, and we've rotated and moved the second one off to the side in a, in a square to be a cube. I've also kept some of the code from the last slide where they move back in space before uh, continuing so it doesn't clip so terribly. But cubes are boring. So here's a pentagon. Uh, it's exact same except for the math to make a pentagon is a little different than to make a square. So there's some math in here that you can review later. It's pretty basic. It basically says, given n number of sides, what is the position and rotation of each object so that they meet each other and make a shape. So in this case, we have five sides, so the angle between them is 360 divided by 5. And the distance from the center point so that they meet up nicely is this nice trig function. Uh, here's an octagon. It's pretty much the same thing. Just plug in new values. If you're using, this is all written. All the demos are in SAS, so I just ran through some loops and ran some math. Uh, you can do a more complicated transition shape. And then here's the clipped version as opposed to extending outside the frame. Uh, you may notice that as we got to a larger uh, number of sides, the center point has disappeared way up into the top. Uh, to maintain the relationship between them. All right, so that's what you can do now. And uh, I think it looks great on mobile, it runs great on mobile. So it's, it's worth including on your apps. Uh, but I want to talk about the near future and things that may not be entirely about CSS. So as I mentioned, we worked on the Google Zeitgeist site, uh, which was actually written in 3JS. And it uses a component called the uh, CSS 3D Renderer to translate the, the system of 3JS, which is a scene graph that lets you move objects uh, and nest them inside of each other. And it lets that apply to CSS. And so all this JavaScript, this giant pile of JavaScript, it outputs to just uh, you know, transforms and perspectives and other styles inside of your CSS. Oops, wrong slide. This should not be, this is responsive and it's responding correctly. The screen is too small. Um, let's see.
All right, I'm going to give up on that one. All right, so basically what we had was a 2D map, which would look kind of like a Google map when you're staring at it uh, with items on it. As you interact with the scene, it folds down uh, to appear if it's laying on a table, and all the uh, Google map pins pop up from it. Another thing we've done with heavy use of, uh, of 3D and CSS and also in 3JS is a Google map dive. I'll show a short little video of how that project actually worked. If the Wi-Fi cooperates. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Gonna ramble for 27 seconds. <laughs> All right, so the interesting thing about uh, 3JS is that you can render to multiple renderers uh, at the same time. So it has a canvas renderer, which tries to draw a 3D scene in a 2D canvas API. It has a 3JS, uh, the, sorry, the CSS renderer, which takes CSS objects and rotates them in 3D. And it also does WebGL all at the same time. So what you can do is you can combine these two and, and, and stack them up. It's because the weird thing about CSS 3D is that everything remains interactive. So if you want to have a 3D scene, you know, objects on a cube or something, uh, you can still select text on them, you can still interact with them, you can still do hover events, you can, you can do all these great things. But in WebGL, you're just drawing pixels, basically. And doing UI in WebGL is super hard. So you can do a hybrid approach where you do WebGL for all the fancy graphics and you do CSS for all the UI. Uh, 3GS matches them up, so they sit on top of each other and they move like each other. So this is the map dive. Uh, the bottom layer is an actual Google map. Uh, this is just Chrome running here, nothing fancy. Uh, in the foreground, the video game portion, is all in, in WebGL and 3JS. So these are 3D models. There's a camera chasing a little man throughout the scene. But it's, also, it's combining uh, the Google map, which was pure HTML, with uh, WebGL. And finally, the near, one of the near future items is CSS custom filters. So CSS custom filters is a means of taking the same kind of techniques and, and things that we can do in WebGL and moving them to CSS and to be called from CSS. So these filters are little C functions that run on the GPU, and they change the positioning, shape, and colors of any object. They run directly on the GPU. That means they're super fast. You can make it, I mean, entire video games are made this way. Currently, they're only in Chrome, and they're behind a, a dev flag. But there's a ton of possibilities. Sorry, that was the wrong one. So Adobe has given us the CSS Filter Lab, which is a place where you can go play with these animations. So for example, we have a normal uh, scene on the left-hand side, we can apply a Spherify CSS custom filter. At the bottom, you can see how that's applied. So there's a vertex shader, there's a fragment shader, these are two little C functions. One is responsible for taking the flat plane of content from HTML and wrapping it in a sphere. And the other is responsible for doing things like colors, which gives it the shadow and the gradients across that. You can pass functions and numbers into these shaders. Because they're in C, they're, they run on the graphics card. You can't inspect them. They're hard to use. But you can pass variables in from your side, and you can run CSS transitions and CSS animations on these values. So you could have a transition that rotates this sphere. Um, there's some other ones in here that are pretty great. But the idea is basically being that we can, in the near future, take existing content and transform it in a, in a 3D way without uh, breaking the content we're interacting with. So while 3D CSS will let us do planes and squares and simple rotations, this will actually let us put things on a sphere, uh, you know, light them on fire, have them burst into confetti, all kinds of crazy uh, animations. But uh, we're going to need uh, uh, GLSL C programmers, actually empower us to do that unless everyone wants to learn C. 
So I made a little quick demo. I don't know how long, how quickly this will get into Chrome, but maybe by next year we'll be able to do the Fancy Pants page curl uh, natively instead of as an image. Woo! <laughs> All right, and that's actually the end. Um, slides are up. They're on uh, slides at that URL. All the code is in GitHub. It's all run through middleman, so you can get a <laughs> boot course in that really quick. Uh, but it's also compiled there. If you want to inspect any of the math in the SAS functions, it's also there. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>